So if you follow our Facebook page regularly, uh, you may have seen yesterday that I teased about today's sermon, um, A Time for Defiance, and I said that we would look at uh, Queen Vashti. Uh, we heard about her in the Old Testament lesson that Ruth read for us this morning. Um, a Canaanite woman uh, that Mary read for us from the book of Matthew this morning and dot, 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 Christopher Walken? Christopher Walken? Yes, uh, Christopher Walken. So um, I thought about this a little bit, whether or not I should own up to uh, really, really liking something that Christopher Walken did that may come off a little, uh, I don't even know what word to use. Um, so let's just go here. Um, there is a movie that Christopher Walken was in. Uh, it is a comedy, um, and it is, well, it's raunchy, okay? It's raunchy. Um, and I don't talk about it a lot, and I don't uh, put things up about it a lot because there, there are things in it that, you know, some of you may find offensive, uh, honestly. Um, but you know what? At the end of the day, it makes me laugh. It just does. It makes me laugh. Um, I try not to be ashamed for the fact that something so raunchy could make me laugh so much, um, but it does. And, and it just, it is what it is. It makes me laugh. Um, the movie is called Wedding Crashers. And if you, um, if you are fearful at all about, um, you know, relations uh, outside of wedlock or foul language and things like that, please don't watch it. Please don't send me hate mail. Please, please. Um, I promise there's a point to the story. I promise. Um, so in the movie, Christopher Walken plays Senator Cleary. Um, and, you know, I, I could get into more of the movie, but the point here is Cleary is the father of four children. He's got three girls and a boy. Um, one has just gotten married. Um, another is engaged. Um, and the other two, one is in a relationship and the son is not yet um, in any relationship. So uh, the scene that really touches my heart, uh, really, really speaks to me, is one where Senator Cleary is with his daughter Claire and they are looking for flowers for Claire's pending wedding. Uh, she is engaged. Um, but Claire is uh, questioning uh, the, the relationship that she's having at that point and whether or not she really wants to go through with this wedding or not. Um, it is known throughout Washington, D.C. that if Claire marries the man that she's engaged to, that this will be two powerhouse families joining together. Um, people are looking forward to the wedding and, um, you know, the pomp and circumstance around that um, and the fact that Claire will then be married. Um, but as she and her father are walking through this flower mart, um, the senator realizes something is going on in Claire's mind. Um, and he pauses with her and he asks her, so, you know, what's going on? And she takes that question and turns it to the wedding. Um, She's looking at all these flowers. She could go with tall tapered arrangements or short little things on the table. And she ends this paragraph with, I don't know. And the senator looks at her and he realizes that there's more to that I don't know um, than what meets the eye. And he says something to her that I have said to other people, I've quoted him many, many, many times because as raunchy as the movie may be, this line is so honest and so true. He says, look, we have no way of knowing what lays ahead for us in the future. All we can do is use the information at hand to make the best decision possible. I think about that so many times. 
if someone has a family member in the hospital, if someone's going through disruption at work, if someone is having trouble paying bills, if someone has a huge decision in front of them in any realm of their life, we have no way of knowing what lays ahead for us in the future. We have no way of knowing. I mean, think about it. In January, did you think to yourself, well, on October 11th, I'll be watching church through Facebook. I don't think any of us did. I don't think any of us expected that. We had no way of knowing. So all we can do is take the information that we have and try to make the best decision possible. And sometimes those decisions are really, really hard. They're so hard. So let's look at Queen Vashti for a second. Um, the king has been in power. It's been, the story says, 180 days. Um, and he's throwing a party. And the story, it, it doesn't tiptoe around the fact that he and the guys around him are getting drunk. They are. They're having a good time and they're getting drunk. At the same time, Queen Vashti is having a party for the women. Um, and so these parties are separate. The men are in one and the women are in another. That's, that's an interesting thing to note here. They're not all together in the same place. So at the end of a week of partying, the king says to the eunuchs, go get Vashti for me. I want her to come and I want everybody to take a look at her because she's so beautiful. So they go, they take the king's commands and they go to Queen Vashti and they say, come on, queen, the king wants to see you. Now, all we have from the passage Excuse me one second, let me make sure that I get it correct. Um, but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command conveyed by the eunuchs. That's all the story says. It doesn't tell us what she said. It doesn't tell us what she was thinking. It doesn't give us any other um, context for Queen Vashti. And let me also say for just a second, you know, this comes from the book of Esther. Uh, when I talked to my family about um, the story, I led with, hey, who knows Queen Vashti? No one knew her name. No one. Not even me. You know, I, I said to Pastor Eliza, just remind me of who it is on October 11th from that um, Faces, uh, Faces of Faith journal that we're supposed to do. And she said, oh yeah, it's Queen Vashti, uh, Faces of No. And I went, awesome, okay, let me go read about Queen Vashti. I didn't know who she was, I didn't. Um, Esther, I knew Esther, I had heard of Esther. That was a name that was familiar, but Queen Vashti, to me and my household, we didn't know until we read the story. And all she does is say no. Now, I have to imagine that the eunuchs at that point must have been flustered. What do we do? Do we really go back to the king and tell him that she said no? Is that what we do here? Um, I have to think there was confusion and uh, some measure of what next, what, what will happen now. If we think about it from Vashti's perspective, she must have thought the same thing. This was not routine. This was not something that she would have done every day, tell the king no. But it's important. It's so important that it made its way into the Bible. We know her name and we know 
in one sentence about her that she defied the king. She said no. It did not turn out well. Not in the immediacy of her saying no. The king became enraged. What does it say? At this, the king was enraged and his anger burned within him. He was upset. He was angry. He didn't want to be told no. And yet she did it. She had to have known, don't you think? She had to have known that if she went and she put herself on display in front of untold numbers of drunken men, that it would not have ended well. And so she took the information at hand and she made the best decision she could for herself in that moment. King got angry. And eventually, uh, I think if you continue to read in the story, um, he's not pleased with Vashti. She does not remain in the high esteem that she had been, um, even though she's still beautiful. That didn't change. But her response to him was not one he wanted to hear. She didn't know what was going to happen. She could have probably guessed a little bit, but she didn't know. And if you go further into Esther, if Queen Vashti had never said no, Esther would never have become queen. So I'll just let you think about that for a moment. Let's jump to the Matthew passage for a second. Jesus is traveling with the disciples, and here comes a Canaanite woman, begging him to help her, begging him. And he doesn't even respond. He did not answer her at all. That's what the passage says. But she didn't stop. Right? In a time when women were subservient, um, and the men around Jesus were saying, tell her to go away. All she does is keep screaming and hollering at us. Tell her to go away. She doesn't. She doesn't go anywhere. She doesn't take that rebuke and just go away quietly. She knows in her heart that Jesus can help her daughter. She has that information and she decides to continue. And when Jesus says to her, I, I can't take the, I can't take things from the children and give it to the dogs. I can't do it. Now we could have a seminar over that sentence alone that Jesus would have even said that to her. But that's not what today is about. Today is about a time for defiance, a time to say, no, we're not going to go with the norms right now. We're going to break that. We're going to defy what we've been taught to do. What we've been taught is maybe the right thing. And we're going to take the information that we have and we're going to do something with it. And she continued. Yeah, I'm not asking you, Jesus, to take it from the children and give it to me. But if you give it to the kids, even the scraps that fall from the table, the dogs get to have those. She continued on. She pressed on. She continued to talk to him until he finally turned to her and told her, you know, your faith is so great. Okay, your daughter's healed. And she was instantly, her daughter was healed. 
we think time and time again, there, there are seasons for things, there are times for things. We don't necessarily stop and say to ourselves, every now and then, there's a time for defiance. There's a time to say no. We're not going to do it that way again. We're not going to do it the same, same old, same old. We're going to change something and we're going to do something a little bit different and we're going to see what happens. We are in a time right now, my friends, of great controversy, great angst. Oh, so many things going on. I am not saying to you that you need to be the ones defying anything at this moment, but I am saying to you, take the information at hand. And there's so much of it. There is so much information out there. Just go look and you'll get plenty of information. Take the information at hand and make the best decision possible. That goes for every aspect of your life. If someone is telling you to do something that you really feel is incorrect, it's a time for defiance. If someone has arranged a marriage and you think it is wrong, it's a time for defiance. God will be with you all the time. And even when you don't know what the outcome is going to be, he has a plan. He knows. He is there with you each and every time, every step of the way. So as the weeks unfold, as you decide about church next Sunday and who you're going to vote for and what Thanksgiving and Christmas will look like in your homes this year. As all those things become decisions that you have to make, take the information at hand and make the best decision possible, even if it's a bit of defiance. In the past few weeks, Pastor Eliza has ended her sermons with the picture from the journal that we're using. I'm going to change that just a little bit this week. And the picture of Vashti is going to be shown during the postlude today. So I hope you'll stay with us, um, stay all the way to the end, and see the picture of Queen Vashti. And think to yourself, are there times when I need to say no?